So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending our panel, the uh, conference language is English, and uh, we're delighted to uh, have our experts coming from all over Europe today to join us in our discussion about Europe and the digital economy. We stand on the brink of a new industrial, I've learned by Mr. Hotkus, evolution, not revolution, driven by new generation technologies such as Internet of Things, cloud computing, big data, robotics, and most of all, artificial intelligence. Recent studies estimate that digitalization of products and services can hold, add more than 110 billion of annual revenue to the European economy in the next five years. The digital economy is growing at seven times the rate of the rest of the economy in Europe, but this potential is currently held back by many factors, and we're about to find out what factors are determining the digital future of Europe. We would like to discuss the challenges and all and foremost, hopefully, the solutions. Please welcome our distinguished guests as presented in alph alphabetical order. Um, please welcome uh, Michael Böhmer. He's partner at EY Econ and EY Economic Advisory at EY Germany. Ernst Young. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Victor Meyer Schönberger, he's Professor of Internet Governance and Regulation at the University of Oxford. Welcome. <laughs> Marie-Elisabeth Rusling, she's CEO and member of the board of Business Angels Europe located in Brussels. Welcome. <laughs> and we welcome the Chief Competition Economist of the European Commission in Brussels. Welcome, Tommaso Valletti. Before we jump into the discussion, let's have a look at, set, set, uh, at some numbers on Europe and the digital state of Europe. Please have a look.
So these have been some numbers of the so-called digital economy and society index. Uh, most recently, there have have been uh, the most recent numbers been published by the EU Commission. If you're interested, check out the website of the EU Commission. There's an updated document waiting for you there. I now would like to ask our panelists, our experts, to share their views on our subject in an opening statement, 10 minutes each. Problems they identified and uh, as the, uh, mentioned before, we're interested also in ideas and measurements to overcome those challenges in order to boost the digital economy in Europe. In alphabetical order, uh, Mr. Boomer, would you like to share your views, please, with our audience? Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to talk about trust, just like Mr. Pardon did at at the end of his speech uh, yesterday, and you might ask, hey, why is this guy talking about trust? He should talk about digitization. Um, and you're absolutely right. Trust is generally really not the first issue that comes into your mind if you talk about digitization. But uh, I would like to sketch out for you that trust is really the fundamental factor if the digital transformation of our economy and our society in general is to be successful. In this regard, by the way, capitalism and digitization have a lot in common. Trust, as you all know, as economists, is one of the most valuable assets in market economies. Why? Well, simply because uh, it's completely impossible to define every last detail of a transaction in terms of a contract. It's the trust in our counterparts that encourages us to enter into deals with people we've never seen before in our life. And just as important is the trust in institution. So if an individual culprit should try to take advantage of us, we can rely that institutions design rules and we can enforce them if necessary. If however trust is lacking, transaction costs escalate dramatically they become prohibitive. And the market economy simply would no longer function. By contrast, mutual trust reduces transaction costs and is one of the main drivers of economic growth. It's a form of social capital. And now consider trust in the context of digitization. Here, believe me, it's even more important from its perspective of a user, we've heard that before, many processes are completely anonymous. Whether online purchases, online sales, whether uh, a banking transaction, whether uh, you do a post on a so-called social network, for every, every of these visible transactions you see in the surface, um, there are numerous invisible transactions being carried out in the background namely transaction of data. And in principle, and uh, to a certain extent, more or less uh, a certain extent, every one of us is aware of this fact of these transactions in the background, but nobody knows exactly what takes place there in detail. We simply trust that, well, nothing bad is going to happen to our data. Now, certain digital innovations want to make us believe that trust is obsolete. Uh, but we should not let fool ourselves here. The argument, for example, uh, that the blockchain does not require trust because each, tra each transaction is immutably documented on thousands of computers, this argument, uh, sorry, is simply misleading. That's not true. Because if you conduct a transaction in bitcoins, of course, you place your trust in both in a system as well as in people. Of course, you trust that the number of honest users is large enough to prevent possible manipulations. 
There's no guarantee for that. You trust in it. You don't know. And in my view, I'm very convinced there is no digital innovations on the horizon that eradicate that need for trust. And this, by the way, is uh, also good news for society in general. Recently, digital or trust in digital enterprises and their business models have been shaken to core repeatedly. We all know these examples whether it was large-scale hacks of user information or whether a social network decided to provide sensitive data to third parties, by the way, making hackers' efforts redundant, so probably more efficient, in transparent terms of condition or data so-called protec protection, which uh, does not have to do much with protection rules, to which probably no one of us would ever agree with full understanding, and after reading them completely, no one reads them completely. They all contribute to an erosion of trust. At the core of these examples I've given, there are, in our view, existential threats for digital business models. Trust in people evolves gradually, often in the course of years. A single negative experience um, will not necessarily erode the basis completely. On the other hand, trust in firms or trust in systems lacking such emotional relationships as in people, they are quickly destroyed. i just give you the hint at what's happening or what has happened to Facebook in recent weeks. They're wrestling with it currently. This is exactly this mechanism. Therefore, firms with digital business models um, have one imperative, and this imperative is be more transparent. And this is in, at their individual best interest. That these firms might threaten their own business models through more transparency, uh, transparency is simply considered. Because Transparency does not imply sharing detailed specifications of each and every algorithm. By the way, one would perhaps see that the one or the other of these algorithms are not that intelligent as they make, believers, make us believe. Transparency, in fact, um, requires, that, requires that firms enable the users to understand which data on them is collected. Not more, not less how they are analyzed, and to which uh, use they are put. And trust in data security is the indispensable foundation for long-term success of digital business models. In this way, data security and data business models, they are not a contradiction. They are indeed complements. They are really complements. The same mechanism I've tried to describe for companies, holds for states and their relationship to the citizens, even as um, administrations undergo their own digital transformation. If I am just, for instance, if I am to accept that my fingerprint is among the data stored in my passport, um, there must be considerable trust that the same state's police will not automatically be able to access this information. If I don't have this trust, I would have problems to, to agree to give my fingerprint, of course. But the role of the government goes far beyond. It's fundamental for the success of digital transformations and can thereby, to come back to our title, uh, contribute really to reshaping Europe. On this, just a couple of points. Digitization requires an institutional framework. We all agree, I believe. It requires regulation. But note that regulation, of course, does not imply maximal interventions. Extreme solutions, we all know, tend not to be optimal in economics. Uh, they usually are not, but any solution is somewhere in the middle. And the challenge here for the regulators is uh, to find the right degree of regulation. That is, of course, not simple, but that is necessary. And with uh, 
It's uh, General Data Protection Regulation in Europe. We've already talked about it. Mm, Europe has taken, in our view, really a big leap. And uh, by the way, the world has taken notice of it. In the upcoming years, it will be interesting, it will be fascinating to see whether this regulation has turned out to be the required step in the right direction. And uh, just personally, I'm very confident that it will. In the context of regulations, states have to consider the economic interests of firms, but also the economic interests of the employees. They have to consider a level playing field to maintain between firms on the one, on the one hand, on consumers on the other hand, and one should not forget this, they should also keep in mind that there might be, or there are certainly, distributional aspects of digitization, just as of globalization we've heard yesterday, and this is really another serious challenge in this context. And this is, of course, a huge ta task for, for the states. Actually, it's a huge task for Europe, because there are no di digital business models one can think of that stop at national borders neither physically nor economically, because just the economies of scale in digital, digi digital business models, they are just too big. So national regulations would, in a way, um, pervert the idea and the possibilities of digitization. But if we find solution for these tasks in Europe, we would not only enhance trust in digital transformation, allowing us to, to reap the associated economic benefits. No, we would also um, well, rejuvenate, if I can say so, trust in Europe itself. Only joint solutions at the European level can both be the foundation for a dynamic digital economy and develop alleviate citizens, diffuse or concrete, even concrete fears associated with digitization. The, business, uh, the, the founders of the European community some 60 years ago, they undertook, undertook a visionary project for peace and security. Digitization is not a matter of war and pe war, peace in the original sense. But it's a matter of future and it's a matter of safety. Where if not here, the European Union is called upon to act. Here Europe can position itself really as a pioneer for the world and for cohesion and cooperation on our continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Burma. We will discuss this in detail in a bit. But uh, next, in alphabetic order, Victor Meyer Schoenberger, would you like to jump into our, sure. into I, our discussion? Uh, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm going to focus on a very particular subset of policy and regulatory issues with respect to the digital transformation. A and that has to do with competition, but not maybe in the way that you think about it. So a lot of people are concerned uh, about the rise of very large internet giants, the gaffers of the world, the Google, the Apple, the Facebooks, the Amazons of the world, and they point to rather dramatic concentration of market forces. If you look at uh, Amazon's ability to capture about one out of two euros in the online sales transactions in Germany. That's an amazing amount. But it's the same amount in the United States. Amazon captures 50% of the online market there, too. And when we look at not just Amazon, but also Google and Facebook, we see that Google and Facebook together are capturing about one in three dollars or euros spent on advertising online worldwide. So there is a significant market concentration happening. And a lot of people are concerned that those very large 
internet giants become larger still, that there is a concentration around a small number of companies, and that this means and signifies a revival of the firm, a revival of the company uh, as a large organizational unit that is able to capture a lot of revenue and to translate it into high profits. I don't think that's right. I think it's exactly the other way around. Namely, that these large internet giants, the gaffers of the world, aren't successful because they are companies. They are successful because they are markets. Because they are running a marketplace in which they are able to capture a lot of the transactions and therefore generate significant revenues and profits. In other words, the gaffers are successful not because they're superstar firms, despite the fact that they're called that way, but because they run a very effective and efficient marketplace. Now, why is this marketplace so much more effective than, for example, offline marketplaces or either online other marketplaces? And the magic here is that they are extremely good at matching preferences on markets together. And this matching has two foundational sources. One source is that now on these online marketplaces that Amazon and the others run, we have a lot of data, rich, comprehensive data available about each other's preferences, which is eminently better than what we do in offline markets, in most offline markets, where we tend to concentrate or condense preferences into a single figure called price, and then we begin to compare prices. On online markets, we can go beyond that. We can do uh, a preference uh, matching based on rich and comprehensive data. And we can do that at relatively low cost. But then there is another increasingly important element, and that is we now have mechanisms available online by which we can improve our matching, our finding of preferences. These, these matching tools come with different names. Sometimes they're called digital assistants. But what I, what I look at are mostly recommendation engines. Think about Amazon's recommendation engine, venerable, been 20 years in the making. But it accounts for 30% of Amazon's revenues. That's a very significant amount. Why are people buying stuff that is recommended to them? Not because they think that it is a stupid idea, but because they think that this is precisely the product that they're looking for. In other words, Amazon is a phenomenally successful marketplace because they're phenomenally good at matching preferences. They are creating what's called consumer welfare. They lower transactional costs through transactional search costs going down uh, and matching costs going down. There is significant consumer welfare being generated by the gaffers. And that is why Everybody and their mother moves from offline markets to online markets, at least over time. And that is something to celebrate. There is consumer welfare being generated. But it's not just consumer welfare that's being generated. Also, company profits at these gaffers is being generated because consumers are willing to pay for better, improved, superior matching. And that's what they do. Now, looking at those large marketplaces, we find that they have the data, and the, the data is being shared about the preferences, and they have the recommendation engines, the digital assistance available that, that enable and fuel and facilitate that matching. Now, as that happens and consumer welfare is being generated, as I just outlined, something important shifts, and that is the value generation. The value isn't generated necessarily by the marketplace anymore. It's not liquidity itself that generates, liquidity on the marketplace that generates value. What generates value is bringing the people together that uh, then produce transactions. The matching is where the value is being generated. How is that value being generated? 
It is being generated through those recommendation engines that are in turn driven by data. Data about preferences, which of course those marketplaces have because they capture all that data. In other words, the gaffers are so successful because they are successful in matching. They are so successful in matching because they have the data from which they learn how to match the people and the preferences. Now, so far, so good or not. But what does this do? It creates something that we don't like in markets. Not market power, but centralized decision making. Let me explain. Markets are phenomenally successful and robust and resilient because decision making in markets is decentralized. Everybody makes his or her own decision. And so if somebody makes a stupid decision, then the market doesn't go bust and therefore the market is resilient. But when we look at markets like Amazon's online market, what we see is that a third of all transactions are based on a recommendation that comes not from the individual or the friends of individuals, but from a centralized recommendation engine. In other words, we have a centralized authority that assists people in decision making and therefore creates a centralized decision making dynamic. This means that the resilience and the robustness of the market depreciates. In other words, those online markets are superbly successful because they create consumer welfare. But by doing so, they undermine the fundamental quality of what makes markets markets, namely decentralized decision making. And when we look at them and we go further down the road, what we see is that we have a market that essentially at the end is more like a planned economy, where there is a centralized decision-making assistant that tells more and more and more often to each one of us what we actually should do. So what can we do if we have a centralized planned economy in the making? then it's not only a power problem, it is also a problem about resilience. There is a single point of failure. I am not suggesting that Amazon is deliberately driving us towards a particular brand or product. I'm suggesting that this bias may be built into the recommendation engine and Amazon might not even know it. In other words, we may look at Amazon's marketplace and see there is a single point of failure, and that is that assistant, that digital assistant uh, in the center. If that's the case, then we need to worry, because if then that single point of failure fails, not just a single transaction goes wrong, but the market goes bust, and that is incredibly dangerous. Now, what can we do about that? Some suggest we need to break up Amazon or Apple or Google. I don't think that's a particularly good solution. We've seen with AT&T that if you break something up and wait 20 years and don't do anything about it, uh, then AT&T is back. You fight the symptoms and not the root cause of the problem. Others suggest that we need to tax them. Tax is a redistribution of the outcome, of the output. That's a perhaps a nice idea, but it doesn't address the root of the problem. The root of the problem is that Amazon's matching is so superior because Amazon has all the data that makes the matching superior. And therefore, what we need to think is, why can't other matching assistants be successful on Amazon's platform? And it is because they don't have the data. They have no chance. And so, my policy recommendation is to think innovatively about mechanisms for making the large gaffers share some of their data, not expropriate them from the data. They should still be able to use the data as they see fit, but let others, in particularly smaller and medium-sized, innovative 
competitors have access to a slice of the data, of course anonymized and all that, of course randomly selected, and therefore then have the raw material to be successful. This is nothing outlandish. We already do it in Germany in the insurance field. We have insurance data pools. We already do it in the United States. When Google bought ITA, a travel back office company 10 years ago, the Department of Justice forced Google to share its data with its biggest competitor, Am uh, Microsoft, for over 10 years. So it's not outlandish. We can do it but we need to move into that direction and thereby improve the antitrust regulatory regime that we have in the European Union from looking at behavior to looking at the disparate distribution of raw material. Thanks very much. Marie Elizabeth, would you like to continue, please? Thank you very much. It's quite uh, appropriate that alphabetically I come to speak after Maya because I will speak from the small guy, those who should help us uh, take up the challenge you, you propose. So I'm Marie Elizabeth Russling. I'm running a European Federation, quite a startup actually, uh, dealing with business angels. And today's, I think this conference is very timely, but it also we find at BAE uh, quite high time that we should discuss uh, these issues. Um, there's some very positive, some optimism uh, already, uh, as we, we heard yesterday from Commissioner uh, Oettinger, but Commissioner Moedas, in charge of research, science, and innovation, actually has stated for many years now uh, important uh, recommendation that uh, substantiate all the uh, action and taken at EU level and uh, here's a few quotes, one I like in particular because it captures what we too try to do as uh, finance uh, providers to, to this SME and scale-up economy. So digital empowers the users to, to innovate, gives opportunities to newer, smaller, more innovative players to challenge existing markets. So hence my point uh, in connection with the previous speaker. Um, great and recent news is the conclusions of the European Council. So we have heads of state coming together and in good agreement, but also um, that you know, we should work towards a stronger inclusive ecosystem that we've discussed since yesterday to foster breakthrough. And this is a very important thing, so how to support businesses with the disruptive potential. And this is why uh, it makes sense to actually look into what has been done. And what I will uh, propose is uh, to look at it from the very perspective of business angels. So what we are as business angels, you know of, of business angels, so they have two wings. They bring money, but it's smart money, so they also take part into the journey to accompany the start startups to grow and scale up. Uh, BAE itself will represent networks um, that, from the structured angel markets, essentially, in, let's say, good old European countries. So we have 250 uh, networks, and through these networks, and that is the visible part of the market, there are many more, uh, we represent more than uh, 40,000 individual angels. The map, this is our Europe at, um, at BAE. And in terms of figures, you can see that in this structured market, um, you have this asymmetry that we've uh, heard about before, how you know, between the UK, for instance, and uh, the rest of Europe, the numbers of networks or so structured networks accompanying individual um, angel investment are, are very different. But overall, um, being you know, the voice uh, to, to policymakers in, in Brussels, where, where we are based, we also are very keen as a federation to research the market. And this is a particularly difficult task because, uh, again, there's a lot of invisibility in, the, in this market. But we also take it uh, at heart to um, professionalize our investors. 
uh, they are not just individual, but they actually invest better and more efficiently in networks. But we also are growing our own market in the sense that we try to build capacity to transfer knowledge from our networks in the most advanced structured markets to uh, other uh, business angel population. And we work particularly uh, trying to also stimulate much more uh, women investment because in Europe, if you just double the number of women angels, you would come to like 20% of business angels being women. So we only have 10%. So imagine the potential for uh, the innovative and uh, the digital companies. We run projects uh, to do that, uh, two European projects, one on, on women angel investment and uh, one to build capacity uh, between networks going all the way to Moldova, the Balkans, etc. So why I'm here today, it's because business angels and the digital is a special affair. It is the thing. In fact, 93% of our investment goes into innovative, so in a wide sense, um, innovative companies. But because we um, intervene at a super early stage, we end up identifying investment opportunities in tech, in, tech, in deep tech. Um, so this is our kind of legitimacy if you want to be here today. We consider so digital is really the thing also to allow the companies uh, to deploy power, to scale up, and essentially to go global. So we are looking as smart money providers for tokens of excellence, and therefore, back to my first point, end up you know, working a lot in identifying these uh, companies we're uh, using and making the most of digital. Overall, our investment per year is about 2.5 billion euros into uh, the early stage economy. But what we see more and more, and this is a very important factor on the role of business angels, is that we actually create, generate a leverage effect uh, so that bankers are looking at early stage, but also funds, VC funds coming uh, also closer to, to startups, uh, will then complement the initial investment of the angels. So we consider we have some special insights to share. Unfortunately, it's not so rosy. Um, some hard truths we want to share from our data, our research, our experience on the ground um, is, of course, you, you know, the figures. So top digital firm will, will grow, you know, much better figure than many other. Uh, we, we have, you know, we saw the, the little film, so the data economy is very important, how it, it will contribute to, to year GDP. However, artificial intelligence, 83% comes from outside Europe. Our unicorns in Europe would be uh, estimated at about a number of 28 out of more than 200 worldwide. But more worryingly, I find, is this last point, that two-thirds of the top companies that will make it in terms of scaling up and really generating gross uh, wealth in Europe will actually be sold outside or will have moved to continue to grow. And I would like to add uh, one point. is is the way things are happening. And we heard from the uh, first speaker this morning. In US, they have the companies, but also the regulators, the government, they consider that the innovation path there is too slow and they are fully on an acquisition path. Whereas in the EU, we are still selling. Of course, as uh, we see from, from the EU level, work is still in, in progress. It's recognized that digital is mainstreaming, it's new levels, and value creation also comes from digitalization among more traditional industries. We have the digital single market strategy uh, and lots of stimulus packages uh, from all sorts of uh, local, regional, national, EU level. So it's all very good, but we are uh, you know, facing very, very big disparities in terms of digitalization, whether e-government or companies, how they take it up. The financing of the digital economy is still completely lacking behind in, in, in Europe. And what we see as business angels is, is twofold and a double problem. First, our companies we're helping, they still do not have a European market. They would be often forced to set up in another EU country to actually engage in this market. 
whereas the investor itself, our business angel, would find it very difficult to follow them because they have no idea how they're going to be treated legally, fiscally, uh, when they exit this company. And our angels, they tend to invest for like seven years. So it's, there's no visibility and only very few member states who actually give a good uh, explanation as to how the investor would be treated uh, to, so that he or she can continue to, to support the companies when they grow at least EU-wide and we're not even talking globally. So overall, how do we really embrace the digital challenges is far from being solved. So what could we do? We've heard you know, the, about the harmonization issue, everyone agree, but we need more stimulation really to get more of this early stage investment to really get the companies up the first step uh, to, to grow and uh, build new models, uh, challenge, uh, if not the GAFAs, at least uh, global competitors. I would like to add that in our experience, we find that we should also bridge another gap, which is a gap between the digital hubs and their peripheries. We are faced with too many sort of deserts between digital hubs and super digital uh, cities, small cities, etc. So the um, uh, digitalization really is, is uh, not connecting yet all these different uh, hubs. And there's a kind of fashion, or maybe it's fad, uh, for, the, for the decision maker to look at these hubs and see how great it is, whether it's Munich and the region and others. But in between, you know, what, what do we do about it to diffuse, disseminate uh, digitalization? The education challenges, the training of people, the upgrading of skills, of course. So all this should unlock potential and should be dealt with now. So we really work towards a single market. How it can be done? We have three uh, proposals. One is to really look at, and to, at to a new regulation for startups, which would mean when we have an SME definition, we do not have a, a European innovative company definition, and that would help, be helpful because then you could imagine that for those who invest and take the huge risk, or like angel investors, to invest in this kind of super innovative companies, our future, then we could perhaps uh, think of recognition equivalences of a sort of passport for individual investors like has been done for uh, some funds uh, a few years ago. And as I mentioned before, how do we bridge the gap and connect the ecosystems in our, in our Europe? And um, that's how we need to, uh, in our view, continue to, to work at, regulation, uh, at the regulatory level, but also with the companies, but with the investors' networks to create this smooth market we all need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosling. Tomaso Valetti, would you like to conclude our introductory speeches? Good morning, and thank you very much for um, having me on this very interesting panel. I currently work as a chief competition economist of the European Commission, and I would like to give a few ideas about competition in general first, and then competition and digitization in particular. So general trends in competition, there is a very heated, interesting debate which has started a couple of years ago coming from the United States on uh, increases in concentration globally, states first and then globally. There is some evidence that I'm not just talking about digital markets, but um, uh, more generally, across the board, there is evidence that, that uh, some indices of market concentration has, are going up in the past 30 years. So 80% of U.S. industry had some increase in some concentration measures over this period. Over this, the same period, the share of GDP that goes to profits has been going up. The share of GDP that goes to the labor force has been going down. Okay? These are really trends. Um, the margins that firm make, so the ability to charge above some measure of cost has been going up. Some more trends on dynamism. Every year, firms are created and firms disappear. So a healthy economy is one where there is more entry than exit, you know, because this is a dynamic economy. And this uh, has been historically true, but not again in the past 20 to 30 years. We still have more or less the same exit. So firms die as much as before, but there is much less entry. Okay? So it's more difficult to enter markets. 
And this is happening also in an historical period where, as you know from the work of uh, uh, Thomas Piketty, the levels of inequality, especially within country inequality, is going up. Because these are general trends. As I said, it is a heated debate whether the data which are put forward are meaningful. Uh, people disagree on the causes of this, of, of the, of the, of this possible concentration. Some people argue it is the lack of antitrust enforcement. So the, the, the blame is on people like me. We didn't do our job enough in the past. Other people point more towards globalization uh, or technological changes. So having looked into this data also for Europe, Europe, the situation is slightly different. Um, Europe is more static in general compared to the, to the United States. But for sure there is one trend which is true, which is margins, the ability to charge above cost, is, uh, is at, at least directionally. The, the levels might differ, but the trend is in, undoubtedly true in Europe too, also. Um, and so because this is such a general uh, common trend, uh, worldwide, I think it's unlikely that a lack of antitrust enforcement is, uh, is the reason. Be simply and very pragmatically, I think that what we do, even if we double our intervention rates, uh, we wouldn't be able to affect the economy at the macro, at the macro aggregate level, as uh, these data are showing. So this is uh, not saying that what we're doing is right, okay? But I'm saying that it's unlikely that, that uh, antitrust enforcers can have such an impact uh, globally, so it's more likely that it is technology which is changing. Technology is more and more of a nature of uh, higher fixed cost intangibles, and uh, and this creates uh, um, dominance, and market power, and difficulty in challenging those incumbents. So it's more likely a technological change. It's important uh, I mentioned this also be because we live through a period of. Um, of uh, a populism, so these aggregate trends can be interpreted in very different ways. Okay? The message we get and also the call of protection of consumers can be tilted in favor of one political opinion or the, the opposite. But, but we should bear th th those in mind because uh, something seems to have changed and people are demanding responses which are related to those changes, even if we disagree on the causes of those changes. So let's go to the um, uh, digital side, which is the, f the, f the focus of this panel. Uh, even if it's not related to the current job, I cannot resist to make two more general observations. Um, also, um, also, also in this sphere, there's lots of politics. The internet uh, is excellent reflecting its own commercial nature. It's excellent when we are making commercial choices. As Victor said, we are given the product we like. There's good matching, there's good data analytics. We get what we want. If now I'm Googling, I want to go to Munich Airport, I'm sure I will get the best possible uh, link I need exactly to go there by public transfer, by, by taxi and so forth. I get what I want, most likely. When it comes to politics, it's less likely uh, to understand what, what, what it means to get what you want. If I Google with my history about President Trump, I will get some, some, some views about President Trump. If you Google from Texas for the same query, you will get something, something very much something different. So the debate here is what people want politically, but for sure uh, it, we even disagree of uh, what people should get. It's very paternalistic, but even if I believe that people should be exposed to a variety of opinions, I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good model so that then people can make an informed choice. This is not delivered by those companies because those companies, as I said, have a commercial nature. They give you products. And so what they do in the political arena is, is more complicated. I would argue that even the old model of dealing with a public service obligation in the media industry, in the industry is very likely not to work these days. Let me give an example. The BBC, which is a great company, everybody agrees it's been historically one of the best broadcasters in the world, it made a lot of sense in the past where there was one TV channel available in a country. So if you had very good content, and again, we can discuss what is a good content, but imagine this content was available, it was agreed, people would have no other option. You are in front of you have the television at seven o'clock at night, you watch a good program, and everybody does it, okay? So you can put people in front of that opinion, which is perhaps a good one to inform then your views and make choices. 
the, this model is broken now. Even if, imagine, the BBC still existed, probably it does. Even if I, 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 I decide that some editorial content must be available somewhere, I cannot force people in front of the TV because they will do something else. We have so many options available due to the internet. So this model is not going to work, which is a problem. I've done using my academic hat. Now I have this stint as an enforcer, but usually I'm an academic. I did some real research on the impact using microdata from the UK, the impact that the internet had on intentions to vote, political participation from the, consu from, from the citizen side, because people like us, we said the internet ought to be awesome because we, l we can find a lot of information if we know how to navigate through the internet. We can find it. It should be good to give us more information. It should us make us better at make at making also informed political choices. But we are not representative. We are not representative. Most of the people use the internet as leisure, as, uh, as entertainment. You watch videos. You are with your friends on Facebook or whatever so social network. So uh, wh actually what we find, matching the diffusion of broadband internet by building in the UK and looking at whether or not people turn out to vote, we see that the more the internet diffuses in the UK, the less people go out to vote. And this is entirely driven by demographics. If you're rich, if you're old, if you're educated, nothing happens. You were going to vote as much as before, you still do. But instead, if you're poor, if you're uneducated, and if you're young, which is voting, people don't bother. Okay? Don't bother, they have something else. Something, as I said, the internet is capturing their attention, their time for something else. You don't devote that time to inform yourself, you devote that time to entertain yourself. So these are worrying things, in my opinion. So let's go back to what's been discussed until now. Uh, we, in, in fora like this ones, we typically hear the views of incumbent firms. Deutsche Telekom is an example we heard this, mor uh, this, uh, m m m this morning. Sometimes we, we hear the views of, uh, of entrants. Sometimes these entrants can be small, sometimes can be large. The gaffers are also, they know how to talk to us, and they are super large. But these companies, as, as I said, they are known to most of us as consumers. They are definitely known to us as the regulators and enforcers, and they know how to talk to us. Okay? And then there is the, this potential entrance, which is um, uh, a more uh, a mysterious entity, because we, don't yet, we cannot pick the, the winners. No? We don't know who they are. They're typically underrepresented. Most importantly, there is also a, not only a supply side uh, of the, 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 the regulation debate, the debate, but also a, a, a demand side. Citizens, most likely, they are not going to be here. Sure, they are consumer organization, but it's not clear who they are. This is, we don't hear the, the views of the citizens, but the citizens demand, especially to institutions like us, to understand what we're doing in our jobs. So let me give you some example of what I currently do and, and the way I try to, to, to sell my job to my non-economist friends. I said, what do we do? We do mergers, we do antitrust, and we do state aid. What's that? Okay, mergers, uh, imagine two big cement companies merge, and we want to make sure there is not a significant impediment to effective competition. I've lost the person. I've already lost him. I said, what are you doing? I said, but th that's important. Every building that we have in Europe is going to be made out of cement. That's super important. I've lost him. Okay, so I try in a second way, and I say, okay, let's look at antitrust. Uh, we want to make sure that dominant companies such as Google, they have a dominance in, in search, okay, they're super good, and we want to make sure they don't leverage that dominance in other markets, in Google Shopping. So if this person is a more of a techie guy, is, is interested, but again, the average man in the street would say, but why should I care? Google is free. They, they give me Gmail, they get everything, it's awesome. Google, Google is awesome. What are you doing? So I try with my last attempt, and I say, okay, um, a company such as uh, Apple in, uh, in, uh, in the past paid 0.0003% of the revenues in Ireland. I don't remember how many zeros, but a lot, okay? <laughs> so we want to make sure that, Amazon, uh, that Apple excuse me, uh, pays the fair share of taxes to Ireland. And so we told Apple to pay 13 billion euros in unpaid taxes using our laws. And then the guy says, that's great. That's exactly what you should be doing. So this is interesting because perhaps competition policy is not the greatest instrument to tackle this, which is more about the tax coordination uh, between countries that competition policy cannot deal with. But it's a political win for the commission in trying to get endorsement from the people. And this kind of endorsement, this kind of legitimacy that European institutions need is super important now. This is a very fragile period. Isn't the very existence of European uh, inst institutions is at risk. I will be gone in 
a year. But I think these European institutions are very important. So explaining people what we do, explaining what we do for citizens is of utter importance. Um, now, what do we do with uh, digital platforms? Digital platforms in economic terms, and now I'm talking more in nerdish economic jargon, they are potentially a problem. Why? Because for the many reasons that uh, Victor explained, these are markets with lots of externalities, network effects. If all my friends are on Facebook, I want to be on Facebook. If everybody searches on Google, my quality, uh, my, the quality of my search improves. So there is a, a bandwagon effect that, uh, that leads to, to dominance, to very few platforms em emerging in this market. So economics 101, markets with externalities of this kind, even if they are competitive, don't work. They fail. So I would expect lots of market failures as an economist in markets of this kind. If you add network externalities, this bandwagon effect with uh, dominance, because there is the market structure is, uh, is in the hand of very few firms, this is a, 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 an antitrust concern. It's a big one. So I would expect more rather than less that regulators should, should be looking into those platforms because of the economic characteristics of those platforms. How, what can we do? We can do different things. We can do old style regulation. We dealt with large dominant firms in the past, electricity, railroads, the, all the telecoms. I am dubious this could work, not because economics are much different, but because these platforms choose the location of their intangibles especially patents, data, across the world to minimize uh, the, ta the, ta the taxes they pay. So I think the, the, the model of public ut utility regulation is not really there. Uh, we could break them up. I'm, uh, I'm um, less sure than Victor that, that, that actually eight, breaking up AT&T was useless. The US market is much more competitive now than, than it was in 1983 when AT&T was uh, uh, broken up. But there is some competition, may, maybe not the best, but probably better than it was. We broke up uh, Rockefeller and Standard Oil, so maybe this is the, mon the historical moment in time at least to think about it, to think about it recently. Uh, the more fundamental problem I have economically is that there is lots of efficiencies coming with size. So Google at present, when they maximize, you know, when they do the matching thing for advertisers, they look in our Gmail, they use uh, double click, they use AdSense, they, they, they use all this information in the e ecosystem they have created and they can propose good matching with, with, the, with the advertisers. Don't forget that Google still makes uh, uh, more than 90% of their, of their profits from, uh, from, from advertising. So there, there is going to be efficiency losses, I think, if, uh, if we break them up. So the last thing is to reconsider the burden of proof, and then we can continue this in our, in, in our, in, in our further discussion. The burden of proof in antitrust, I think we get it wrong, uh, we got it wrong in lots of mergers. Think of Facebook, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp. The way you look into those mergers using the old tools is, Facebook, Instagram, these are camera apps, okay? And we look at the traditional market for camera apps and we want to see there is overlaps and then they say, well, there is also some other application, the market is competitive. That's probably the wrong way. Now, with the scandal of Cambridge Analytica, it's funny that lots of people in the US said that we are disgusted by it. I will go away from Facebook and then they communicate to their friends, this is the last day you can find me on the Facebook, you can find me on Instagram, okay? Which is paradoxical because it's owned by the same company. And this is the overlap between platforms which we should look more into. Uh, on, on the antitrust side, we are at least doing our best. As you know, there are, we did uh, Google Shopping last year. Very soon we will come out with uh, um, Android and there will be AdSense. Jean Tirole, and that's the last thing, Jean Tirole, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, is proposing recently something called um, participative antitrust, Nobel Prize in economics in 2014, where the industry, uh, people like you, uh, proposes possible regulations. Okay. And antitrust authorities then issue uh, an opinion, okay. non-binding opinion, but this creates some legal certainty of the new practices which are emerging, maybe data sharing, maybe something like this. And so this is, uh, without casting yet the rules in stone, because there are, there are new industries, but still uh, business people can have some sort of legal certainty. And this participative antitrust is an interesting proposal in my view. Thank you very much.
So let's jump into the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, for your contributions. And I think we have many, many topics to talk about. First, um, something that I think we can all agree on, and Mr. Hotkes uh, already spoke about it, is like the superiority of the big platforms. Just in order to have you uh, participating in our discussion here in the plenary, who in the plenary thinks that we should talk about breaking up big platforms such as Google, Facebook, and so on. Who, who, who is in favor for such a solution? Please raise your hand. OK, a minority, small minority, all right. Who thinks that we should actually try to build our own Facebook social network, uh, Google search engine, uh, Netflix for that matter, or Amazon? Who, who thinks that's, that's the right answer within Europe? OK, even less. OK, two, three, hands up. OK, so to, the, to our panelists, um, Mr. Burma, w what do you think? Is, 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 has that train passed, and we, as Mr. Hatke said, or do you think it's still worthwhile to try to, to catch on? I think more or less the train has passed, and I, um, I would agree to what Tim Hotke said um, uh, this morning, also to what Roland Berger uh, told us uh, yesterday night. Uh, platform market is not the, the whole share of the digital market, so there's only one part. And uh, we tend to be not to be strong in platform markets. We all know we've discussed that. There are, by the way, prominent uh, exceptions. If you think of, by the way, uh, for, for instance, um, of uh, Flix Mobility, uh, you know, all this, these green buses uh, on the streets, uh, not only in Germany, in Europe at all, they, they have expanded uh, to the rail, they, uh, you can take trains uh, with Flix Mobility, uh, they're expanding to the US, uh, competing to Greyhound, and uh, this is actually also a pure platform company that do not own any single bus. Um, they are located, by the way, the headquarters some three kilometers away from here to see Munich. So there's really a, a good exception, uh, but it is still an exception uh, for the mobility market. So um, we are strong historically, economically historically, really in uh, what we can do on the industry side in engineering. I don't want to repeat everything you, t you told us yesterday, um, but in all the Internet of Things, uh, we have a complementary um, competency, and we have a uh, comparative advantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Americans, the Asians, and, and so on. And this really big field and all the B2B uh, digital economy is um, nearly uh, unlimited. So we're only at the beginning. The German industry at the moment is not digitalized. So only 5%, 10%, however you measure that. It's at the moment, it is not. And there's so much potential on this side. And it's not a, not a, uh, we, we are not fools if we concentrate on this. Mr. Rustling, would you agree that we only need to digitize the economy that we're proud of and that we're leading in here in Germany? Or do you think we need to, to step up the game and, and, and add, add different qualities to our already well-running well, market? There's a lot being done um, already for the 99% SMEs to go into more in innovation. What well, we're concerned as uh, investors seeing really this very early stage part of the market is that there's not enough focus on this 1% of SME startup. And this is, you know, our plea. So we need to step up and accelerate. I mean, next year we would have new institutions. It still is looking good, the kind of kit of instruments and the investment proposed uh, uh, now to, to head of states and, and, and parliament to, to pour billions with the right instruments, but we really, really need to focus. I'd just like to add uh, that uh, less than a month ago, we had a visit in Brussels, and believe me, every single directorate general had a representative there at the parliament. We had a visit of Israeli ecosystem uh, representatives. And the title of their uh, two-day workshop and trip to Brussels was Work With Us to Build the Next Google. 
So back to your first question, there are still people out there and the Israeli are very interesting uh, ecosystem and, and investment uh, ecosystem uh, to build this platform. Oh, believe me, the Israelis, so they have chutzpah. I, yeah, I can yeah, tell, I live but, in Tel Aviv. Uh, so the solution yeah. has not been completely put, put aside. Okay. Um, so there's hope, you're saying? Uh, I'm not saying it's the only way because what we're interested in as investors is really the breakthrough, the totally disruptive company, and it's not necessarily going to be in this platform. However, we're super happy to, you know, see startups in med tech, in deep tech, really looking using platforms, but for completely different uh, purposes in the medical sector, connecting universities, research, and even you know industries to go into new fields. So it's you know it's like artificial intelligence you grow, you improve, and can be exponential as you walk. So how do we get people, teams, you know, for the startups to start walking? This is where we say focus on this 1% with potential for disruption. It's an interesting time right now where we're discussing uh, here in Munich uh, this digital economy. We have in Brussels a, a parliamentary session on the copyright directive, and um, we also call it the Google law or anti-Google law, whereas like the publishers try to get a foot into the market that they they have lost over the years. How do we prevent, uh, Mr. Maya Schoenberger, that what um, Mr. Russelling was just mentioning, that in the fields and areas where we are leading right now, medicine, um, automotive, and so on, this is not happening again that Google, with all its data and, and, and superior uh, power, can overtake our, our traditional economy. We already, have, we already have lost automotive. Don't worry. It's already gone. We have no lead in automotive anymore in Europe. Forget but we have record-selling numbers with Volkswagen but this But that year. doesn't matter. But that doesn't matter in terms of innovation. And this is the point. I'll go out on a limb. I'll take Tommaso's lead here, and I'll, I'll go out on a limb here and say, the fundamental problem that we are facing, a bigger problem beyond platforms, is that for a long time we have seen concentrations in markets because of scale economies, because of network economies, because of these externalities. But there was a counterforce, and the counterforce wasn't antitrust law. The counterforce was innovation. That is human ingenuity that came up with new ideas that enabled new entrants to produce services or products um, at, 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 a, at a quality or a cost that the incumbents couldn't do. And so innovation was the counterforce to market concentration based on scale network effects. If innovation is no longer human ingenuity based, but data driven, then the innovation dynamic, the innovation force, is not the counterbalance to scale economies anymore, but is aligning with scale economies. Those that are large have more data and therefore can be more innovative. And that's what we see. The Google self-driving car drives between 400 and 600 percent better than the self-driving cars of European auto manufacturers. Why? Because Google has about three orders of magnitudes more data. Oh, so much for optimism in this discussion. Uh, Mr. Valletti. Yeah, sure. Just go ahead. We have a discussion here. Sure. I want to elaborate a little bit on what Victor said. So there's um, um, a book by a, a guy called Dave Eggers, who is called The Circle. They also mm. made a, an, an Hollywood movie out of it. And there is a, a scene. Uh, so this is company which is a mix between uh, Google and... Uh, so it's, uh, it's Google, basically, this, this company. But it's not called uh, Some that Some say way. it's Facebook. And yes, it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's a Google and Facebook, that's right. Uh, the, and there's a, um, somebody who just joins the company, and then uh, the, the, some, a colleague says, now it's plankton time. Okay. What the hell is plankton time? Though? This is a model, the, the moment where all the Silicon Valley small entrepreneurs, the plankton, they come here and they hope to be swallowed by the giant whale. Okay. So uh, entry for buyout, which is in the innovation uh, that he was mentioning, 
I think it's, it's a bad one. Entry for buyout is just a model of innovation where you hope to be Swallowed. able to, to capture some of the rent of the incumbent. Okay? So this kind of entry is something that we should try to prevent. Innovation is important, but innovation to become a contestant. Not other, other, otherwise, so Google, going back to Google, they bought we know, YouTube, they, 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 they bought Waze, uh, they bought DoubleClick, they bought uh, DeepMind, and many more and many more. Some of these transactions don't even come under the radar of, of antitrust authorities because given the tools we have, I can look into a merger only if it is above a threshold. And the threshold is based on the turnover of the last year. Some of these companies don't have turnover. So I don't have the powers, okay? I don't say, I'm not saying that I should have the powers, but if we don't do anything, going back to the original question, antitrust will not be the right tool just because we don't have any tool in that sense. Either we sharpen those tools, or perhaps the only option is regulation then. It's okay, regulation. but let me, let, me, let, let me throw in a, 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 a term that was coined this morning by Mr. Hutkus, co-opetition. So would you say that we need more competition or more cooperation? We need, okay, and now I'm talking okay. uh, as an enforcer, you know the answer. We need a, a lot of competition. Currently, Europe is getting more and more lonely. We know that, okay? It's been said in this, uh, in this conference many times. And uh, as, as a competition authority, I am the loneliest of all because people don't like, in a moment of crisis, telling people competition is good is not a strong message because people perceive competition as, or lack of, whatever, whatever people uh, associate with competition as what's been driving towards this moment of uncertainty, political uncertainty, of high concentration, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, from my point of view, and, and, and you can hear now, there is calls for, once used to be called national champions, now they are called uh, European champions, and is a little bit more of a nuance. I don't think that's the way to go. Competition is almost a synonymous for, 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 for competitiveness. So if we don't have a comp competition, we don't have a comp com competitive. So I think we, sh we should strengthen the competition angle a lot. What I don't get is, um, on the one hand, we don't want like big, super megalomaniac uh, companies, and you're here to prevent that uh, to happen. And on the other hand, there are like startups who hope to become competitors rather than just, you know, like being sold out by the big, big, big four, big five by now. So what, what would you suggest? How can we break through that like circle, a vicious circle that like the big, big super platforms like buy out or all those innovations coming also from Europe, um, just like a black hole, like just, you know, taking them over and making them part of their corporation rather than building our own markets here. Yeah, this is what it is about. It's building our own European system and also investing into a way that we can see the effects of our investment in education, in getting, you know, these companies to start, in the efforts made, you know, from the regulator, from the policy makers, all investment. If then you have to leave to the U.S. You know, when startups go to the U.S., they save eight times the effort in time and, and money just to find the next round of investors. It's, you know, this, this kind of comparison. And we're not even talking of them selling their business. It's just to continue to grow. So at the moment in Europe, to continue to grow glo globally, you have very little stimulant uh, to actually be staying. And you lack the finance to do that. So, so how we do need we to build? build the finance in addition yeah. to finalizing our European market. And it's not just a digital single market. It's a single market itself. You know, there's still borders. There's still uh, so, so many, you know, regulation impacting you that as a small company, as a startup, you have to deal with, sometimes you have to set up 28 times to exploit our very market. So this is something we've been talking about for 20 years, and we have to end this. We have to make the market. So where do, how do we build a sand hill road in Europe, and where should it be located? How do you build? The sand hill road, like the road that comes from Stanford, where you have like all those investors, all those venture capitalists, like left and right, huge like villas, and that's where the startups in the Silicon Valley get their money from. So how do we get that kind well, of a money? Well, you need, you need the, the incentive for more people to actually play this part. 
We just completed a survey and found incredible motivation factor, factors from Lisbon to London, the same about how entrepreneurs, when they become investors, want to give back, when they contribute, want to see the European ecosystem mean something and actually challenge some other powers, and we look east as well as towards the, the US. So how do you make that? Well, we have you know, a, a lot of ground, we have education, we have super clusters, but it is still too small. We lack the critical mass. So one important thing would be uh, also for the regulators and for competition authorities to uh, actually examine why it is such a, a, a blockage for um, stimulus packages, and I'm talking fiscal packages that work to make people become investors themselves. How is it not um, happening and usable in another country? How is it still, because of the national competencies in, in fiscal matters, uh, still you know, applies essentially only to residents of your country? I think only one country like France and perhaps Germany in a way with the invest um, grant uh, scheme is also letting uh, these packages apply to investors who would come from another country provided they invest in a startup in Germany. That makes two countries, and it's not 100% uh, compatible, out of 28. So why not you know, use this, the, the packages that work better in other countries? And one big issue is the, the way the regulatory and competition authorities will look at the application of this scheme to other countries. So that would mm. be one important thing to look at. Before I hand it over to the plenary, I would like to ask uh, finally um, Mr. Burma, because he uh, I introduced us to a word uh, which we haven't discussed so far, that is trust. Mm -hmm. Trust, we also heard sustainability <laughs> is key um, in earlier discussions. So. Isn't it true that, like, despite the fact that people hate Facebook, they're still on it? They're still, as we heard, uh, use WhatsApp, uh, mm -hmm. especially in Europe. So, so the, the, the need for trust, in a way, is, is yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to have, but is it really key in order to, to building flourishing markets? Or is mm -hmm. it, on the opposite, too much regulation at the point where we cannot afford mm -hmm. <laughs> values such as trust? Uh, it's, it's both. First of all, Facebook is just convenient. It's just easy to use. Uh, it's uh, easy to get in touch with the friends whatsoever. Uh, so just uh, uh, convenient. But on the other hand, I, I believe it's true what, what I said before uh, in my speech that uh, people who, who do not really know what happens with their data in, in detail, they're a bit naive. Okay, but. Uh, uh, naivety can also give, be a good protection uh, to, to oneself. And uh, they really believe, okay, nothing really bad will, ha will happen with my data. Uh, I'm not a culprit, I have nothing to, to, to fear whatsoever, it's, it's okay. It's, I'm w just one among millions and millions, or mi million or billions of, of users, so uh, um, there will nothing bad happen t uh, t to this data. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, we've seen from, from recent uh, developments, uh, Ox Oxford Analytica, uh, companies like Facebook might have bigger problems um, if they have such an attack there than old economy um, uh, companies, because they have only this one asset. And um, if, if people don't trust in Facebook anymore, their whole business model can, uh, can, could potentially come to an end. Uh, this is different with other, with other companies who have like a history of, of 30, 50, 100 years and who have already demonstrated they can handle, with cha handle challenges, they can handle structural changes and so on. So the, the quite uh, young history of, of, of companies, this, the very fast upcoming of these uh, companies uh, can also be danger. I, I'm, not quite, I'm not sure if, if Facebook will exist in 10 years' time. I would not uh, really do a bet on this. Okay. There so will be any other company, sure. Sell but your not stocks, necessar please, now. Not, <laughs> not necessarily Facebook. I just say, I'm not right. sure. You heard him? <laughs> you heard him? All right. Um, let's open the discussion to uh, you. If you have any questions to our experts, please uh, 
raise your hand and uh, we'll have a, make sure we we'll have a microphone. Oh, it's over there. We start over there. Please, if you say who you are just very shortly and who you represent. Hey, hello. Good morning. My name is Klaus Masoch. I'm from the European Central Bank, but um, what I'm saying now has nothing to do with mm -hmm. monetary policy. I was fascinated uh, by, by the talk and the discussion. I, I, I heard uh, Victor Meyer Schoenberger saying um, all the nice things economists normally like to hear, myself as well, that these platforms uh, help you to match preferences and to thereby create welfare. You also outlined some risk, and uh, the, the, the colleague from, from the Commission um, also outlined uh, some, some risks. But one risk which I didn't hear really today, and I think that's something we may have to think about. You're, you're talking, I mean, I'm convinced that these technologies have wonderful opportunities, healthcare and many things. So the opportunities, the chances are big and great. But one risk is that it's not about matching preferences, but about manipulating preferences. And then we as economists are at the end of our models, because our models assume, most of our models, that the preferences of the individual, individual the representative agent, are given. And we know that preferences can be manipulated. We know it since long that uh, advertisement has always two components, information and manipulation. But now the potential for manipulation has tremendously increased due to the data. And, and you have to wonder why Google and Amazon are hiring increasingly neuroscientists, the best of the world, the best psychologists, the best neuroscientists, are highly paid at Google, Amazon, and Facebook. Why? Because they know how to manipulate our brains. And that's a danger, and there I do not agree with you that naivety is sometimes good, because if you look in the history, not least in the 20th century, naivety, or looking the other way, or not standing up, was often, if many people were naive, then the catastrophes happened. So be careful. The, the Google and Amazon and Facebook, there's a very good book by Robert Lustig, a uh, medical expert from the US. He wrote that book last year. It's called Hacking the American Mind. And this was the professor who went against the sugar industry five, six, seven years ago. Uh, there is a very interesting article by Angus Deaton, Nobel Prize winner, okay. about the opioid crisis. I'm just asking you, is there not a big risk that with this big data, Amazon and Google and Facebook know myself, know everybody who uses the platform much, much better than your husband or your wife, and even better than you yourself. All Thanks. right. Thank you very much, Mr. Valletti. How do, we, how do we deal with those neuroscientists that are growing in Silicon Valley, paying no taxes, and you're saying we shall not break them up. So, so, so what to do to get the genie back in the bottle? Actually, it's interesting that, for instance, uh, recently we are looking at lots of cases, and then one was uh, Apple was buying Shazam, and we wanted to know this, is this application that recognizes music and then tell you, what, so, and Apple has also music. So we wanted to see whether there could be any anti-competitive concern, and so I learned a little bit about the technology. I knew nothing, obviously. I'm, I'm too old for those things. But then it turned out that, for, that Apple, and in particular Amazon, Amazon has the, Microsoft, uh, the, the, the microphone always on. Okay? So I didn't know if, you are, uh, if uh, the, your Alexa thing is always on, and they can have uh, voice it recognition, once. And, yes. uh, and they know what you're saying, and probably they do the good matching. So I didn't know. You know, when I spoke to the uh, teenage uh, son of a friend of mine, he knew, okay, so the, the generational gap. So this thing that they, they can get to manipulate about us is, 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 is a real threat. How do, you go, how, do, how do you go after it? So one thing you can say, uh, we hope that competition will solve the problem, okay? So because if you're given something which is no good, manipulate it sooner or later, some, someone else will, uh, t will uh, tell you. Currently, we are in a, in a situation where there are three dominant online platforms, Google, Facebook, and, uh, and Amazon. The, each one of them has his own turf, where they're super dominant. Search, that's Google. Social networks, that's uh, Facebook. And uh, the marketplace, that's Amazon. And sometimes they overlap. Sometimes they overlap. So 
if you, we believe, and I'm not answering fully the question, but if we believe that that competition at the margin is enough you know, to put an end to the worries you have, there, then uh, that, that's it. If we believe that's not enough, then, uh, then we have a serious One problem. Minute. Okay, thank you so much. Let's, let's hand the microphone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's get really quick, questions. really sure. quick. I, I just wanted to say that um, our, we don't know whether there is manipulation happening or not. We might be wanting to be careful about it, but more important than anything else, we might want to be careful who we give all of the power in the first place. Whether they're intentionally or unintentionally manipulating us is secondary if they have all the power, because even if they don't want to manipulate us, they might be weaponized to manipulate us, which is the Cambridge Analytica story. All right, so let's uh, continue here. Thank you. Sorry. Well, thank you. Andreas Fier, Deutsche Telekom. And just a short question, because we discussed this this morning and uh, some talks uh, with uh, Clemens Fust in this context is the question, we all know that data is the new asset, the new currency. And one thing in the political debate right now, and I saw some remarks from you, um, Victor Meyer Schoenberger, in German newspapers, is okay, let's tax it. Yes, let's tax this to have a level playing field. Let's, ta let's tax the great Americans in this context in Europe. Then we can take this money for innovation, for R&D, and so on. Hi. I would be interested in uh, a response from you. OK, so you raised also the question, why don't we tax the hell out of them? OK, so uh, taxation, going back also to what I said about Apple. What are our current tools? So we went after Apple because Ireland has one of the lowest uh, taxation rates in, uh, in for, for corporations in, in the Europe. That's fine. But they also, according to us, they wrote like a sweet deal specific to Apple. Okay? That was the specificity that made it not good for competition. Other companies in a similar position could not get the same deal. So that's the tool we currently have. I think a better option would be to coordinate the, 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 the tax rate across Europe, and then you can get something out of it. But this is the problem of Europe at, the, at present. So we were talking about uh, how to fund venture capitalists, and there was a, 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 an, a, and indeed we should be less stringent on state aid to small companies. Let's do that. But we currently already have zero state aid rules for truly European projects, because this is not where there is a competition to the bottom among states. If it is a European project, then rest assured that there is no state aid. You can fund whatever you want. But these projects don't, don't get going. Why? Because France wants to give the money as long as they are sure there will be French companies involved. Italy wants to, to give money as long as there the, 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 the will be it, Italian companies involved. So this is where it really gets Europe together and would solve a lot of this problem on the taxation, on the investment. So this is what we should be calling for. All right. Final question, please, Mr. Berger. Yeah, I, I have just one question or observation. You mentioned uh, the, the, the danger about creating more and more monopolies because the monopolists already buy new uh, startups, new ideas uh, when they are still young, when they need money, etc., etc. The, the, the th think about behind this is the simple fact that most of these startups are made for exit. They're not made to, uh, to create a company for generations. Sometimes really big companies uh, come up, but uh, generally the financial industry, particularly in, in the Valley, less in Europe as we know, uh, they are made for, uh, they have the influence on create those monopolies by selling their companies to uh, the big monopolists of today. So the financial industry should be, I think, should be also screened by the anti-trust, uh, anti-monopoly uh, institutions. Short reply. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Berger. So an analogy from another industry, 
pharma and biopharma, there's more and more evidence of so-called killer mergers. So some mergers are great. The small bio company, biotech, who needs the funds, and then there is good screening. Right? Those are the things we should allow. This is good for growth. But often, and this is precisely when the, the new startup, the new biochemical company is doing something which is very close in the product space to what the existing company is already doing, they are purchased, and then they are discontinued. This is the type of things that we shouldn't allow to, to, to happen. Instead, the mergers, which are good for Finding companies, by all means, this is the best way of uh, getting them rolling. With uh, regarding the the time, because you're all hungry and we are about to release you for some lunch, I would ask our experts, our distinguished guests, for one one phrase, one sentence answer to the question. Since we uh, have to cut it short a little bit. It seems to me that the next big thing we kind of agree is, is artificial intelligence. So if we all agree that this is a, a field that we see there is a lot at stake for the future of the digital economy, especially in Europe, what would you, what would you say needs to be done in order not to miss that train yet again, but be ahead of the game this time? And we're talking about like the next, I don't know, 10, 20 years of, of development. So it's not too late. But what is there to be done in order for Europe to have a foot in the game, in the door? Would we start, please, with Mr. Böhmer? I'm, I'm not quite sure if we can really say um, it's, it's not too late, but uh, let's, let's take this <laughs> prime. Um, Come on, uh, optimism. <laughs> okay, it's not too late. Of course, we just at the starting of the in artificial intelligence. No, we're not. We, uh, so, so maybe the tr train's already gone. Um, well, we, I think we need uh, um, things what uh, it's represented by, uh, by Marie and by, by Thomas, and I'm, namely uh, the topics of, uh, of startups, of investment and also of a sound regulation, and that is not easy to find. So I don't have this one answer, but uh, I think we can define the fields in which we have to act, and we have to act uh, rapidly, and we have to, to act uh, coming back to reshaping Europe, uh, really not on a national level. Smart funding and smart regulation. Ms. Well, I couldn't agree more, but uh, I would add uh, start now. We had a decision last Friday that member states ask the Commission to prepare the plan. And this Commission will end in one year. So can we, and that is a good test when we're talking about reshaping Europe on our own institutions, knowing, having all the right analysis in place, can we rise up to this challenge and build this plan and make it happen with the point, you know, smart money and, and the market, and an harmonized market. So, so this is the time. Get the plan going. This yes, is now. the time. It's, it's, it's right now. Um, Maya, Mr. Meyer Schoenberger. Uh, clearly, I think what is missing is the mindset. And we need to change the mindset. Uh, the mindset that uh, lets us understand that ignorance is never bliss. That, in fact, if we want to move forward, we need to learn from the data. And we need to, therefore, utilize the data. And, therefore, we need to embrace it. Change of the mindset, and last not least, Mr. Valetti. I think what is um, your remedy? we have. Uh, we are at the moment in time where we, we, we there is too many contradictions in Europe. So on the one hand, we are calling for investments. We want to attract talent, train talent. We have world-class universities, world-class companies, uh, manufacturing world-class products. But at the same time, we are also closing our borders. These two mo models of attracting talent and closing the borders are incompatible. So I don't know what's the answer to that, but at least we should talk to the politicians that there are real costs. Maybe that's in the preference of people. They are willing to pay an economic cost to, to be more homogeneously re represented. This I don't know, but at least we should explain them what are the consequences. So what we're doing. So to wrap it up, um, it's really hard for me to stick with uh, Mr. Hutke's optimism, but what's left is maybe one word, and I hope you all agree. What we need is courage. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for joining our panel today. Thank you. <laughs>